Thanks again for the invite. Uh, Jamie kind of flopped this on me a while ago, and I thought, boy, do I really want to get into applied research conference and talk about our uh, story on the on the Milk River? And I said it's it's a little complicated. And she's like, well, I'll focus in on some of the water quality work and some of the other things that we're doing. And so I I diverted away from that, and I've got I think I I think I got maybe one slide with a chart in it, and that's and everything else are photos. But uh, yeah, I'm the I'm the executive director for the Milk River Watershed Council of Canada, and if this works, there we go. Uh, we're, we're one of 11 um, watershed planning and advisory councils, so we're arm's length from Alberta Environment and Parks. And um, uh, we're a not-for-profit charitable organization, and our role really is to provide that local voice to our community uh, for concerns to be addressed through uh, science-based planning, research, monitoring, and uh, education, and then most recently, stewardship work. We've really been working directly with producers and uh, making sure that we get our, our hands dirty and feet wet, too. Uh, regards to the, the Milk River watershed, uh, the, uh, um, we're uh, relatively small in the big scheme of things. We're tied to the, at the head and the hip with our partners in Montana as well as in uh, southern Saskatchewan. Uh, the, uh, the system, uh, the, the water in the system is, is heavily uh, reliant on a diversion from the St. Mary's down in Bab, and I'll get into that here a little bit more. Uh, that's the probably the largest uh, uh, interbasin transfer that happens in all of North America, and uh, and little little is really known about it, uh, and it's not even recognized in Alberta or the federal government. So, for instance, if our community it was interested in trying to transfer water from, say, Ridge Reservoir back down for a municipal pipeline for the village of Warner, the, the town of Milk River. Uh, we can't even get federal funding because it was, it's considered an interbasin transfer, even though we have no control over the one that's happening just below the line, and it does make a huge impact on our entire system. Uh, in terms of, of land cover, the most important thing to notice there is that almost 80% of the watershed in Alberta is still native grasslands, and um, that, that uh, uh, the, the, the orange areas on there, or the cultivated land, is critically important to, to helping our producers. And uh, most of our producers are mixed operators. They, they, they uh, run cattle on the native grasslands and, and uh, are supplementing with forage or, or uh, oilseed production or grass or um, cultivated production to, to support uh, their operations otherwise. And uh, when we start getting into uh, looking at biodiversity and some of the land use issues, especially in our watershed beyond the water, uh, when you realize just how much cultivated land and the different land management that's happening just across the line from us, really ends up becoming, you can see how, how our, our producers are really islands in terms of the connectivity between, between these different areas. And uh, you know, that makes it a bit, bit of a challenge when you're trying to develop either regional or national policies that deal with uh, things like species at risk issues, and uh, uh, it's just one more of the landmines that we try to navigate with with helping with working with our municipalities and producers. Uh, another interesting map again is that is this this one here on land ownership. Uh, the the green areas again are are right associated with the with the native grasslands, and they're also our public lands and uh, and provincial grazing reserves. Uh, on the Saskatchewan side, you notice the, the large blocks of orange land. Those are actually now former PFRA pastures that have mostly been transferred to the province. And uh, in Montana, we've got uh, quite an interesting mix of federal and state lands, as well as uh, some important uh, Indigenous communities and, and First Nations. So. Uh, back more into uh, irrigated production. This is this is the interesting story I'm going to get into here right away. But uh, in Alberta, uh, we have no uh, irrigation districts on the Milk River. We're, they're all independent private irrigators uh, that are that are reliant in a lot of ways on that uh, uh, diversion water that's coming in off of the St. Marys. And uh, so there's about right now there's just under 9,000 acres of irrigation uh, directly adjacent or on the on or right. Uh, uh, pretty much on on the Milk River in Alberta, uh, in Montana they call it the the High Line communities all through Malta, Haver, right down through Glasgow to pretty much the confluence of the Missouri. There's between 93,000 and 106,000 acres 
of irrigation. So the, the diversion that comes down through the St. Mary's system and into the milk uh, is often re referred to as the lifeline of the high line. And uh, uh, in the early days, there was a lot of parallel uh, development, we'll say, between this almost this Highway 3 corridor th um, through southern Alberta with uh, irrigation development and, and, uh, and that, I think it's Highway 2 uh, down along Haver, Malta, Chinook, uh, Harlem, those areas. And uh, in a lot of ways, Alberta continued to invest in, in uh, our communities and into irrigation and, and sugar beet production and specialty crops. Um, a lot of that was started down in, in the High Line in Montana and those communities have really fallen into disrepair because of a lack of, of investment in, in infrastructure and, uh, in keeping, and they're struggling to keep their communities alive down there now. So again, to tell the story, you really got to back up quite a bit. And uh, I got some, some interesting photos. These are available through the Glenbow archives, but uh, uh, the A.E. Brown collection, was. these were taken in 1912. A lot of the um, uh, the early history down in our part of the world was um, uh, was started by some of the major the big cattle ranches when they when they moved in uh, you know thousands and thousands of a head of of uh, livestock were moved into the country in the, the between 1880 to uh, actually even before 1880 but but around that time right through till uh, uh, to the early, the early 1900s uh, this is a spot down. Um, just off of the Milk River Canyon before you get into the Pinhorn Ranch. So um, this is a kind of a tongue-in-cheek one as well in that uh, that 1912 was a pretty wet year and a wet spring. And uh, so this is the out for a pole photo uh, on the on the Milk River down there that A. Brown got. And uh, it's kind of a rarity uh, for our part of the world to see that much water and have it pond up that much. Um, uh, this is probably a little bit more realistic to where we're at and, and uh, you can kind of get a, an indication by looking at that braided channel in the river in the background that um, there, you know, there's, it's a naked river, there's not a lot of cottonwood development or, or a really extensive riparian area even though it's a very broad wide channel. Um, and this, this particular area really far, further out east is what we call the sand bed reach so it's, it's, uh, it, it changes almost hourly in terms of where the Thalweg, the main, main part of the channel is. And it's, uh, it's, it's always been a, it's, it's been a challenge for producers uh, from right from the beginning. So uh, move, moving uh, ahead into between 1910 and 1920 uh, was uh, the, uh, uh, the start of the St. Mary's diversion. So by 1907, there was already establishments by, by the Mormons and Kimball were, were already had legal right for irrigation development. They were working on developing the uh, irrigation canals to bring water uh, to Lethbridge, and and Montana was playing was playing uh, catch up to an extent, and they recognized the opportunity to move water from the St. Mary's a river, a river basin that had uh, more than enough flow to uh, to this the smaller Milk River basin, uh, and basically use Canada as a canal to take water down and uh, and to help populate that high line communities and that were that were growing at the time so. This was, um, uh, some of these photos, if, if anybody's interested in taking a second look at any of this, um, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation has an excellent archives of some of their early infrastructure projects, and you can find, if you do a bit of a Google search, you can, you can find them pretty quickly, but uh, uh, this, this is an interesting photo. If, if anybody's familiar with that country, this is uh, just south of the, car, of the uh, Carway border crossing. Uh, just just north of Bab, this is where they're doing site prep work, clearing for for the Saint the Saint Mary's Diversion Canal. Uh, you know, it's and it's a different world. I love going back and looking at the the, the old the old Fresnos and and uh, some of the some of the equipment that they're they were using. This is um, this is up at Sherburn Reservoir, so that this is where uh, during late summer months. Um, Generally, 80% to almost 100% of the river flow in the Milk River is St. Mary's River water, period. And that's made possible because of the Sherburn Reservoir, which is up just on the edge of uh, Glacier National Park and, and goes back into, into to many glacier. So this, this photo was taken in, uh, I believe, 1917. This is when they were developing the, 
the tall tower uh, structure that still stands today. And uh, this is probably a little bit grainy and blurry for you guys, but uh, this is actually a photo of mule trains that were bringing in eight foot siphon tubes in pieces all the way up. These were first brought up from um, uh, up the Missouri system on, on barges and then loaded up onto, uh, in, into these mule trains and moved up all the way into uh, uh, that BAB country in order to develop the, the two big siphons that feed the Milk River system. And then here's a photo. This is again, this is the winter of 1917, I believe. And all those big block pieces are chunks of the, those eight foot siphon tubes after a windstorm blew them all around. And th those are extremely big, heavy pieces to be moving around. This is actually a 1930s photo where um, it, the, the engineers back then must have had some, some pretty big sets because uh, I, I, I can't imagine the work that went into developing these projects with the technology that was done at the time and you get 20 years into the project and you're still not 100% sure it's going to work right. <laughs> and uh, this is an example of it in the 1930s where uh, the, the two twin siphon tubes that uh, uh, that, that divert the water over the St. Mary's and then siphon water back up and drop it into the, into the North Fork of the Milk River system. Um, it was like a, like a charged garden hose, where if you get a lot of pressure in it, it starts to, to twist and turn each direction. So they realized that they actually had to add, this is uh, almost 20 years after they were completed, they had to actually add cement collars to, to hold things together a little bit better and, and, uh, and do that. Uh, there's uh, five drop structures that takes the water from the St. The Saint Mary system down into the milk in Montana. This, is, uh, this, this photo is interesting. Uh, I want you to kind of think about how nice this, this uh, retaining wall looks here on the side, here on the last drop, drop structure. Uh, again, this is 1917. Uh, these were you know, done earthen, these, the canals, uh, if they seen the canals that we had on the St. Mary system, for instance, on the main line, uh, nowadays, these guys would have thought we were paved with gold. Uh, these were earthen canals built out of the side of the hillsides. Um, this is a this is a, cap, uh, a cable pole that was uh, cleaning out a, a, a landslide into it in the early 50s. This is, I think, 1952, and uh, uh, it's pretty incredible that this stuff is even still working today. So here's some more recent photos of that Sherburn Dam. This this uh, t uh, tower in the middle is act is that one that you seen in their construction earlier. Um, the, not a lot has changed to this structure since it was completed. Those are in those early days, and uh, uh, there was an addition added to bring the the full supply height up a little bit higher elevation in the early 80s. But besides that, uh, nothing has happened since. And I was talking to one of the U.S. Braille Reclamation guys on a, on a tour we did down there about four years ago. He said, yeah, we, we, um, in 2012, they did 20 core samples on the cement on some of the original structure that's still back behind this. He said, yeah, 18 of the cores didn't even make it into the pressure test. The concrete just fell right apart. And he said, yeah, one of them made it into pressure test and failed. Uh, the last one, we put it in, and we, we couldn't believe it. It, it, it survived. And he says, then we pulled it out and we realized that the both ends had, had, had crumbled and there was a chunk of rebar that was perfectly aligned in the middle that kept it from <laughs> falling apart. So he's like, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're well past the best before date with a lot of the structures down in Montana. And this is what's keeping our communities alive and being able to, uh, uh, to, to deal with these, these challenges. Uh, here's kind of a schematic up, up there by the upper St. Mary's Lake. Uh, and uh, the diversion dam that comes off the St. Mary's uh, going in, into uh, those, those two big uh, uh, first set of siphons that you see. And again, you know, this is stuff that was built during the age of the Titanic and steam riveted, hand steam riveted with, with horses and I think one steam shovel. And um, it's incredible engineering for its time but it's getting, it's getting old and dated, and when this stuff breaks down, we're without water on the Milk River in the middle of summer in five days, we're, we're, we're seeing a dry river in different areas. Uh, so it's, it, uh, I don't think that uh, very many people realize just how fragile the system has become down there, and it's fix on fail. 
This area here is also often called the Bab Car Wash because when it does get a big split and one of those rivets pop out, you got a rooster tail that's 20 feet in the air that uh, you can drive underneath and get a free car wash if you really need to. So this is a couple shots of some of the uh, drop structures just a couple years ago when we were down there with a the tour. And uh, I don't know if you can recognize that, that uh, retaining wall, but that's the one that was built back in 1917 that hasn't been replaced. And that's actually three quarters inch plywood and two by sixes that are holding the wall in place. And that's, um, that's literally, that works okay on my farm until things break down, but uh, that should not be the way we're, we're running infrastructure that's, that's supplying uh, water for communities in two different countries. So um, the backup to where we're at today with the Milk River Watershed Council, our real role is we're facilitators, we're, we're, we convene, we, we do some applied research and, and, and science, um, but our, our main, uh, one of our main uh, goals is that education literacy, and we try to implement uh, projects with our producers. Um, and on the Milk River itself, uh, by having such an artificial system that runs us, we are really operating like a canal, which provides a lot of challenges from everything from bank stability and erosion to maintaining aquatic health to issues with water quality. And the reality is that we have two separate rivers. We have a natural flow river that happens over the late fall through to the early spring over the winter. And we have, uh, uh, you know, the, the thousands CFS basically going through in, in the other seasons. And that has a lot of challenges. So balancing everything from uh, surface water availability to groundwater to land use to species at risk and you know, trying to maintain the economy for some communities down our way, it's a real challenge. Uh, one of the main projects that um, we've done for the last 13 years now actually is our, our um, long-term river monitoring network. Um, so Alberta Environment and Parks has one site in, on approximately 300, 320 kilometers of river, there's one site that's monitored monthly. That's at the Highway 880. You can have a literal train wreck at one end of the watershed and be lucky to notice that in terms of water quality impact on the other side. So um, we've, had, we've got concerns from producers in terms of water quality issues, questions about um, you know, our, our, uh, our industrial sites uh, on the Montana side, for instance, on some of our tributaries, they're still doing um, uh, pit flaring and there's runoff coming off from some of those sites and causing concerns. They want to know what the, what they're, what's going on. Uh, we've got that, uh, uh, we've got people within the community and the NGO, and the, the environmental NGO world that question whether or not our producers are doing the right thing with regards to fecal coliform management and runoff issues with manure. And uh, uh, up until the Watershed Council started doing an extensive program and working with our municipal partners to do this work, uh, there, was, there was no data. We didn't have any answers for anybody. Uh, so um, in partnering with both Alberta Environment and Parks with some of the analytical work and ensuring that we have QAQC standards and our municipal partners for helping us out with uh, on the ground operations, collecting samples for us, having their staff trained up, uh, us coordinating the entire program and doing some analytical work on it. It's really provided us the most complete data set for any major watershed in the province. And we're really proud of that. And the reality is that this is a really good news story for, pro for producers. I'm not up here showing some, gar some charts with, with Crazy, uh, crazy numbers in terms of, of contaminants in the river for a specific reason is that we're doing a good job. And our role as the Watershed Council is to really tell that story. Um, uh, even, even some of the scoping studies I've done looking at uh, uh, pesticide residues, for instance, have not found much. Uh, the, there has been traces of, of heavy metals and unfortunately some of that heavy metal work um, is really expensive to do but it appears that it's localized and it's having a, a minimal impact in terms of our community. Um, and this work really has helped us identify some of those, you know, greasier areas where we, we can be working with producers to, to, uh, to, to do uh, some projects on uh, to reduce impact from livestock or access or 
or, or just bare ground disturbance issues. And, um, and the, the work that we've done for the baseline water quality monitoring has really helped us uh, define where to work and also be able to leverage that to get dollars to do, to do what we're doing. And we've really been filling those gaps in our knowledge. Um, so for instance, um, one of the projects that we, we just we completed a few years ago was on fecal source tracking. And this is using DNA uh, analysis of our water quality samples where we found a high fecal coliform count. Uh, we can go in and actually uh, use indicator um, uh, DNA from different species to actually uh, uh, figure out where, where it's coming from. And, and, and unfortunately, we had a few Alberta Health uh, communications folks that really like to point the fingers at the ag industry and said, well, of course, these are coming from agricultural producers and they're the ones to blame. Um, so we had approached a few different organizations and then we ended up working with uh, Dr. Lisa Timonson's lab within in Alberta, uh, Alberta Ag to do some microbial source tracking work. And uh, uh, <laughs> one of the funner projects that we actually had was we took some volunteer pooper scooper guys out to, to actually build that DNA library and make sure we had known sources of everything from uh, cattle, horses, sheep, and then even some I actually had to go chase across the field to see an antelope, take a squat, and then get fresh samples from an antelope. So, and even scraping, scraping uh, swallow crap off the wall of the, the river was not the funnest thing in the world. So, and uh, coming out of this applied research was that we really were able to tell the story that stop, stop just directly pointing at agricultural producers. There are some markers that are coming from potentially livestock sources on the river. Um, but, but having a total fecal count was not, and putting an advisory out was not telling the full story. Um, the reality was that um, uh, a num uh, in the majority of our sites and the timing of the sites, uh, a lot of this was actually attributed to uh, cliff swallows, which is something that no one would have believed us unless we actually had the data to show. Um, and that uh, you know, livestock though they were present, they were they were not um, the number one contributing source at, at most sites. And you know, we there is more work to be done, but um, we have managed to uh, change the way work is. Um, some of these sites are evaluated in terms of a public health concern through Alberta Health Services, and now. Um, additional work is done to identify what are the E. coli that are present. Are they ones that are actually causing a human health risk? Uh, how is the timing done in terms of the sampling and, uh, and the monitoring work? And the work that we've pioneered in the Milk River watershed is now applied elsewhere. And I'm, I think, touch wood, the last time that we've had any advisory for, for instance, at Red, the public beach at Reading and Stone was back in 2017. We've had a few years where um, the work that's happened to help reduce some of those concerns of the water quality and the work that's done to help better understand the, the conditions out there has made a big difference. And then again, one of our, the roles of the council is really to, to do that education piece. And we've, we've, we've gone from everyone from educating uh, recreational users, whether they're, they're school groups or, or um, canoers on the river to, uh, to getting out uh, um, uh, to getting out kids out on working landscape and understand with our range days program um, what, uh, what happens on a working ranch and how producers are working to, to uh, improve their management of land, water, and biodiversity. And, uh, and we get out in the community. Um, some of the other work that we've done in this terms of the stewardship end of things, um, more recently we've done a lot more work with uh, uh, grazeable repairing corridors, things like these razor grazer systems are great for, they're expensive, but they're great for um, identifying high priority areas to get cows in and cows out of fast and not having to make a big investment in terms of permanent fencing. Um, and new things on the horizon like the uh, uh, quagga and zebra mussels monitoring invasive species are, are probably our, our second biggest threat in the watershed right now. And uh, these critters have been identified down in the Tiber Reservoir on the on the on the on the Mariah system, and they're pretty close. And um, it, whether you're involved with a municipality and municipal treatment systems, a community water co-op, an individual uh, irrigator, or a 
or, um, or an irrigation district, this stuff has, has got some major potential impact on us. And we've, we were doing some additional work this summer with uh, villager mon model, uh, monitoring on the river as well as substrate monitoring we've been doing the last couple of years. And I mentioned getting kids out, um, our youth range days program. Uh, every summer we take 30 kids out for three and a half days and they, they, uh, they basically learn college level environmental science courses on everything from range management to wildlife uh, habitat and field techniques to soils uh, to, to water quality and, and, uh, and wildlife. And uh, um, that's been a shot in the arm for us that we, we've seen some of these kids go on, they're, they're, they're on the range team at the U of S, so they're, they're become, some of them become conservation officers, others go back to the farm and ranch and, and, uh, and are managing. And by having them better understand what's on the landscape and, and uh, uh, how, things, are, how can, things can be managed well, uh, it's making a big impact. And it's putting agriculture in a much more positive light when we get uh, some of these kids out. I'm um, just going to skip ahead. So, you know, 100, 103 years ago, uh, we built a lot of stuff. And the infrastructure that we did back then, especially in Montana, was uh, incredible engineering and really helped us grow our communities. And areas like the Milk River, uh, Milk River community, and the High Line down in Montana, um, we, we need, uh, we need re renewed investment to keep our communities alive and ensure that there's producers out there to, to, to do good stewardship of our, our land. Um, it's a busy landscape and, and, and in some ways people are saying, well, the, these discussions about building storage on the Milk River have been going on for 50, 60 years. And in a lot of ways they have, but our conditions have changed a lot. Um, one, we, we have a better understanding of those watershed dynamics now than we ever did. Uh, everything from water quality, groundwater to uh, to you know understanding aquatic species at risk, high value habitat, restoration techniques, um, to the changing regulatory environment, and and I think one of the most important things that we have to deal with is that we're at the pointy end of the stick as far as climate change, and we've we've seen changes happening uh, down our way, and uh, any of the modeling that's happened in the past is showing that it's going to get worse. And there's a new optimism out there to work together. And instead of uh, looking at those lines on the map and saying that we can't do anything outside of our jurisdiction or it doesn't matter what happens to our neighbors, we're talking, we're, we're actually working together now. And that's something that hasn't happened in the past. And uh, to me, that's a, that's a really good news story for agriculture. And I had one of the producers uh, t come up to me we, not unlike some of the government agencies that are going through major cutbacks and restructuring and challenges right now, uh, a producer came up to me and said, you know, about six months ago, he says, we're still here and we have an opportunity to do things better and to work together and that's the only way we're getting anything accomplished. So, uh, so that's kind of the story with the Milk River. Thanks, Tim. Is there any questions for Tim? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, the, the question is like, does the Milk River flow into the Missouri? And it does, yeah, just down below Glasgow, so. You bet. Yeah, there's there's legislation in regards to how much goes to, to the Missouri River. Um, I didn't I didn't want to get into the the treaties and the Boundary Waters Act and the letter of intent, but there's um, uh, there's been a, there's been some really colorful history. <laughs> if I want to give a history lesson, if I just get into international agreements, there's been some colorful history down our way and things like the. If anybody's familiar with the Spite Ditch that was built, so after the Americans started developing the the St. Mary's Diversion, they said, well, you know, we could just we could put all that St. Mary's water down into the milk and and use it down on the on the, on the uh, Missouri system and the High Line of Montana and keep on building. And, the, and there was no treaty in place yet at that time. And so the Canadians said, okay, go ahead and try. And they said, well, by the way, we're gonna be building a canal down by Milk River to move that water back up uh, the system and, and drop it down into Etzikam Coulee and, and, and go uh, put it back into the, uh, into the, into the North Saskatchewan system, or the South Saskatchewan system. 
And uh, so they got the, the Americans thought Canada was bluffing. Canada actually hired a crew up from Colorado to build the, can the canal and got her done. Uh, they ran water in it for one day. The American inspectors came up and took a look and realized that these Canadians meant business. And there's still a debate on whether or not that canal system would have actually worked or held up for the long term. But it was enough that it forced the Americans to the table and they, they uh, agreed to develop the International Joint Commission for Water Sharing, which is what we use across Canada for water sharing agreements. And, uh, and, it, and it led to the Boundary Waters Treaty in, in uh, 1909, 1921. I got, um, I'm speaking out of school now without looking at my notes, but yeah. So there, there's some pretty, pretty wild stuff there. But uh, in terms of what's happening now and moving forward though, I, I wanted, one thing I wanted to point out, and Rob, Rob you know, kind of alluded to some of the, the changes that are happening within the GOA and especially ag and forestry and, and environment and parks. Um, these applied research associations and groups like Farming Smarter are gonna be more and more important every year because nobody else is looking out for our producers. And um, anywhere that we can find ways to su of supporting these organizations and, and ensuring that elected officials know the value of the work that, that is happening, whether they're now former government staff people that are gonna be doing some, some work or, or <laughs> even the work that's happening that's being funded within the GOA, um, we gotta make sure that we we support those folks. One more question? Any more questions? So um, Kelly's asking if the Americans are going to put any money into that infrastructure and, and do it. And like I said, right now it's fix on fail. And um, it leaves us in a really precarious position. Um, there has been um, some legislation posted that, that uh, has looked at changing. Right now, the irrigators in Montana are on the hook for 25% of infrastructure upgrades. So 93,000 acres, you figure out what that would cost for about a $180 million to $250 million project. Uh, for upgrades down there, and it's pretty hard to go hat in hand and ask those uh, those water users to to put that that dollar into it when they're really not making much off of the, what they're doing down there to begin with. Um, back in 2007, um, the the U.S. federal government, a lot of lobbying was done. They actually had money in place to uh, redo the canals or redo, redo the siphons. Pardon me and. Uh, and uh, drop structures, and um, what happened in 2008, the economy did one of those, and um, the Army Corps of Engineers, it was one of their projects that they were supposed to be spearheading, and it was, it was cut. So here we are, eight, what, 12 years later, still haven't got anywhere. So it's, um, it's a real challenge. Thanks, Tim.